that's because that's, that's, that's my escape plan. The, 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 the product place. Because this goes yeah. sideways, yeah. In LA, we're in LA actually. We got married there when the earthquake hit. We're one mile from the epicenter. And you know, I've been through earthquakes. You know, yeah, most yeah, earthquakes are like yeah, 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 a little bit yeah, yeah. less. It's like it's no problem. Yeah, why not? Yeah. I haven't checked in all my stuff. Test, test. Oh, okay, we're good. <coughs> okay. I think we're good to go, so let's get started. Um, I'm Paul Kodrowski. I'm, uh, I'm the moderator for this party of ill-dressed people. And uh, <laughs> well, at least partially ill-dressed. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to talk about we're going to talk about big data and uh, from a whole bunch of different perspectives, political, <clears throat> economic, uh, financial, and then you know try and sort of survey the landscape and talk a little bit about what's going on, what we can learn from what's happening in other markets, and uh, and see where that takes us. And I'm going to try and leave time, or I'm not even just going to try. I'm actually going to do it. I'm going to leave time at the end for uh, for some questions. So by all means, be ready at the end if you have questions. The last ten minutes or so, we'll do that. So <clears throat> just to get things going, and before I, I kind of walk across the panel and, and get each of them to quickly introduce themselves, uh, you know, I just thought I'd sort of lay out sort of one way that I'm sort of thinking about this, and we'll see where that gets us. That you know, what's interesting, at least to me, about <clears throat> some of this big data conversation is, you know, why what the drivers are and why it's happening. And at some level, it's sort of about the confluence of a whole bunch of things, right? It's about the confluence of cheap storage. It's really easy to kind of all turn, you know, data hoarder and keep everything that you want to keep, so we can all keep stuff. It's about cheap processing power. We've got all this data, <clears throat> and it's relatively inexpensive computationally and financially speaking to, to, to throw stuff at it. We've got cheap cloud, so it's the data and the storage in some sense, or in the processing in some sense, becomes ubiquitous, and that's really important. So we've got all of these sort of trends coming together, and then you have this incredible sort of instrumentation of the world going on, right? This idea that so many of the things that we talk to, that we use, that we're around on a daily basis, you know, I've always thrown off data in some sense, but now we're consciously not just you know, having the data being thrown off, but we're actively collecting it, storing it, and using it for other purposes and discovering you know, there's some pretty remarkable things that come out of it. Um, so that's, I think, sort of a, in, a, in a broad sense what a lot of this big data conversation is about. And a lot of the critics of big data sort of you know, come at it and say, well, that's all wonderful, but it's kind of like that old story about you, know, you see a great big pile of, of horse manure, right? And the optimist says, you know, there must be a pony in there somewhere. Well, sometimes there is no pony, right? So, you know, we can kind of look at it from both of those two sort of points of view with respect to this great big pile of whatever you want to call it that is this, this incredible amount of data we're collecting. So with that, we have a fantastic panel. So I'll get everybody to just quickly sort of introduce themselves and give a little bit of context for where they're coming from, and then we'll, uh, we'll march into the conversation. So why don't I start here with you, Kevin, just because you're closest. Uh, I'm Kevin Slavin. Um, uh, I worked in advertising for a while. I started a game company called Area Code. Um, uh, we uh, I, I know you were expecting a, a games guy here. Uh, 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 we worked, we built games that used data in some unexpected ways. I guess that's relevant here. We made a, we made a, a $500 card game where you had to send us a swab of your spit and we would send you back a deck of cards that was made of your DNA uh, and you had to play the cards you were dealt. Uh, so just, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, these, these kinds of things, we were, we were making games that, uh, that tied into uh, uh, aspects of the world that other people had ignored, like, uh, like DNA and a lot of other stuff, too. Um, uh, we, uh, the company was acquired uh, by Zynga in uh, 2011. I've uh, been consulting and advising, and I'm now at the uh, MIT's Media Lab. I started a new lab called Playful Systems to keep doing what it was we were doing uh, back then. Uh, I have a, an extensive interest uh, without actually having any participation in uh, the world of uh, high frequency trading and uh, algorithmic trading uh, and follow that quite closely. Uh, I've talked about that a lot. So, okay. Thanks, Kevin. DJ? Uh, hi. And uh, I guess I've been working on data a long time. Uh, my background is uh, I'm trained as a mathematician. Uh, uh, one of the things we early showed was actually how we can assess the reliability of forecasts. And uh, that is now a technique that's used uh, in all the major national weather services. From there, I spent a bunch of time working on national security around cooperative threat reduction and developing technologies uh, to identify threats against U.S. interests. And from there, I uh, really spent a bunch of time in Silicon Valley, most notably at uh, LinkedIn, where I was the chief scientist and built a number of those. My team's built a bunch of the features like people who may know, who's viewed my profile, all of those. The, you post a job, you get great matches, all of those type of things. And uh, I'm currently... Uh, data scientist and resident at Greylock Partners. We're a venture firm invested in companies like LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Workday, uh, and a number of other notable uh, startups. Thank you. 
My name is Jim Messina. I served as campaign manager to Barack Obama's uh, presidential campaign. I've done campaigns all across the country. Uh, thank <laughs> you for the applause in the back. Hold your applause. <laughs> uh, and we decided on the first day of the campaign to use data across department uh, because we thought it was the best avenue to, to the truth. And we ended up using data to inform almost every major decision we did in the campaign. And we had a singular goal to run a personalized campaign where you got a different campaign than you did, uh, all based on our ability to move you and persuade you to vote and support Barack Obama. And there's 332 electoral votes. It shows it worked. <laughs> Frank? Congrats, congrats. Uh, Frank Cooper, I'm the chief marketing officer of the uh, PepsiCo's Global Beverage Group. Uh, my primary responsibility is to, to, to build brand value for the Pepsi brands across the globe. Um, we, we obviously purchase a lot of media. Um, we're in the digital space, but at the end of the day, we have an analog product that's sitting on the shelf. And the, and the question is, how do we tell stories? Uh, how do we build brand meaning? And how can we connect data to that in a way? And, and I'm probably more than likely the contr I wouldn't say the contrarian on, on the panel, but, but uh, I'll come at it probably from a slightly different angle uh, in terms of how do you look at the intangibles and, and marry that up with, uh, with data to, to create uh, value for a company? Great, thanks. Michael. My name is Michael Chewy. I'm a principal at the McKinsey Global Institute, which is McKinsey and Company's research arm. I lead research on the impact of long-term technology trends, including big data. So uh, what I'd like to do to maybe start things off, I'll get maybe Michael, if you don't mind, uh, talk a little bit about it, because you folks are probably the have done some of the deepest studies on the subject. Just lay out the landscape a little bit. When we talk about big data, at least from McKinsey's point of view, what are we talking about? You know, give us the numbers behind the, the big data numbers. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a tremendous underlying undercurrent, as you mentioned, about just the data being generated. If you look at all the data that's being generated in the world, and you compare that to all the possible ways of storing it, right? add up all the disk drives that are being manufactured, et cetera, just the explosion in the amount of data means we can't even store as much data as, that, that, as being generated. And lots of interesting statistics like, you know, the amount of data we generated last year is more than, you know, most of human history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge amount of d data being generated. But the interesting thing, or some of the interesting things about it are, you know, it's increasing in diversity in terms of where it's coming from as well as the forms and types that it's coming in. And it's coming in faster and faster. And our organizations, you know, Pepsi and others, you know, are, are trying to respond in real time. So that's the underlying, you know, just fact about data. But I think what we found interesting and why we studied it as a management consulting firm is that it creates new ways of generating value, new ways of competing. In fact, our point of view is that the effective use of data is going to be a basis of competition going forward for individual firms, for sectors, and even for entire economies. In other words, companies, organizations, individuals who learn to use data better are more likely to succeed, and those that don't are more likely to fail. Um, so that's kind of a strong statement, and that's not really a research finding so much as a belief, but we really do believe that this is true, and we're starting to see nascent evidence that this is actually true. So if you don't know how to use data, you're more likely to fail, uh, and that's, it's kind of a big deal. The other thing that we discovered is that there's no part of the economy where data cannot be used effectively. And so we think, you know, doing your own business better, but perhaps more interestingly, creating new businesses that are based on data, and you know, some of the folks on the panel have done that in various ways you know, elections you could consider a business of a type. So we think it's, it's, it's something that, you know, we're early in a multi-year journey in using data more effectively, uh, but we think that organizations can funda fundamentally make decisions in a different way. You know, there's an old joke that many of us on the panel have heard before, but most organizations make, make decisions on the basis of hippos, the highest paid person's opinion. <laughs> there's lots of data around, but you know, you turn around, there's the person who gets paid the most and they get to make the decision. You know, organizations that take data seriously Think about you know, conducting experiments, like the old scientific method, right? Like what's the hypothesis? What's your control group and treatment group? What happens when you do things differently? What happens when you analyze it statistically and be rigorous about making a decision? That's just a very different way of making decisions, and that's you know, the style of decision making that we think will happen uh, going forward. Great, thanks. Um, Frank, I wanted to sort of bring you in on this point and <clears throat> maybe ask the same question in a different way that is it really, and I don't want to turn this into sort of a hype busting conversation about big data, because I think there's something genuinely new and important here, but maybe just to, to make it more nuanced, there's nothing new about an organization the size of yours learning or knowing that the effective use of data really drives the success of your business. Hello, those are spreadsheets, right? I mean, that's, that's not new information, but so give us some more nuance here. What's changed? Well, it's not new, but there's a massive shift. Uh, so um, obviously we, we have been collecting data and use data 
um, over a long period of time. You know, we collect consumer data at retail. We, co we collect data about media usage. We collect data through qualitative and, and, and quantitative uh, sampling. But most of it is sampling. And that's, that's a ma major difference. We sample a significant portion of the population or a significant group, and we infer from that. The shift for us in big data is that all of a sudden, all the data becomes important. And, and, and the shift is we, now we have to deal with this, this large you know, terabytes and petabytes of data, and, and, and how do you analyze that? And how do you find the talent that actually can analyze it in a way to tease out insights? That's a tough shift for us. Uh, the second shift um, it, um, that we're, we're making is, is uh, around speed and, and, uh, and trying to have, respond in real time. And, and again, it's, it's different for a large corporation because we're used to having things that are exact and that are clean. But when you operate in real time, it's messy. You know, things aren't exact. Things are a little bit fluid and you have to iterate and adapt as opposed to perfect it and then push it out. So that's another major shift. And then, and then the final one for us is um, you know, we're used to talking about the reasons why consumers do certain things. We're looking for a causality. And in and, and big data, it seems to be all about correlation. And, and, and you have to accept that cor you know, the correlations and, and let the data speak. So those are massive shifts that are occurring for us. Um, and and it's, a, it's a different type of, of approach um, to data that, that we're used to. And so, yes, we have massive data. We've always uh, uh, analyzed that data. But now we have to look at the people and the processes and our culture and shift to this, this new kind of world of big data. So sort of a twist, take the same question, Jim. I mean, I've had, in, the, in, the, in, the, after, in the aftermath of the election, you hear, hear people saying that it, almost implying that the Obama campaign's use of data was almost like it was cheating. They were like an unfair advantage. You know, hello, you're not supposed to use that kind of thing. Let's go back to just door to door. Um, Give us your perspective on what's changed in politics from the standpoint of the usage of data. I mean, Absolutely everything. Like seriously, if you think about 2008, you know, the entire landscape had changed underneath us and so we had to reinvent the entire campaign. You know, we sent out one tweet on election day in 2008 because we thought it was a silly technology that would never go anywhere. <laughs> like, you know, Facebook is one tenth of the size. We had 12 people on our data team in 2008. We had 165 in 2012. Wow. We ended up using all that data to change the way we dealt with voters. Because in the old days, people were treated like numbers, and I wanted to treat them like individual people and what we knew about them. So we used data to make huge data sets to build models of behavior. And once we got models of behavior, we could figure out what people were gonna do. So we ranked every single voter uh, in America, including everyone in this room, from one to 100 on whether or not they'd support Barack Obama, on whether or not you were going to vote, and the third kind of new thing that's the most important holy grail, whether or not you had a chance of being a ticket splitter back and forth. And that allowed us, because we had big data sets, the average poll is 800 sample. We did 10,000 per night samples that allowed us to every night for 14 months run 62,000 computer simulations of the election. <laughs> and everything that came out of that is how I spent the billion dollars. So we, every single decision we made was based on the 62,000 uh, sample every night and that was how we did television, that was how we moved the president around. You know, data became the most important thing we did and we you know, put data across the campaign because in the old days, campaigns were smoke-filled rooms with three or four people who were rhinos who said, I've won these campaigns forever and this is how we do it in, in Montana. And we, you don't get a guy named Barack Obama elected president if you take the old rules. So we had to run new rules uh, and we reinvented it using data. Does that, and maybe just, just we're going to start moving forward a little bit now, but does that, how does that change how politics or campaign going forward? Is this a one-time advantage that you guys had because you ex sort of arbitraged, you exploited an opportunity, a data opportunity, and now everyone's like, you know what, that's, that trick's over. Everybody gets to do the same thing. So is there a sustainable advantage in something that you did there? Look, I think it's a good question. The Republicans just did a post-mortem of their election loss, and they really argued that you know, we have a three or four year lead on them and they can catch up. And in 2004, Ken Melman, who ran Bush's campaign, had a big lead like this and built a really sophisticated operation. And we caught up. Uh, I do think the problem, you know, we just have so much data and such a rich amount of data. Uh, and we've gotten really good at predicting behavior. We ended up predicting our final vote in Florida within 0.05%. And we didn't miss any state more than 0.5 percent, uh, and you know that data was used over four years. I appointed our data analytics director for the 2012 campaign on November 6, 2008, 
and they literally moved and started building these things because we wanted to reinvent it. So I think it's going to take a while, um, but I do believe that you know they're going to figure it out too. DJ, um, let's, let's keep going sort of forward, and you know you're sitting in as a data scientist in residence at, at Greylock. Talk to us about futures. I mean, what are you seeing people, what's being built now? What do we need to know about that's coming that's going to change the way that we think about even some of the things we're currently talking about with respect to the usage of data? And then, we'll, then when we, I get, I'll get Kevin in and we'll start talking about, you know, what we, maybe the dark side of some of this, what we need to know that we aren't necessarily thinking about. Uh, yeah, I'll, t I'll take the pro, you can take the con. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, good. I'm terrible at the pro. <laughs> the, uh, you know, I think the, the cool stuff is we're able to, uh, catalog or bring data in, we're able to bring it together. We're seeing all sorts of great developments in technology that allow the accessibility and uh, the ability at speeds to, to turn on data to get it to be uh, something that can be leveraged. The, the big challenge, and I think a lot of the things that are really now starting to become tangible, is how do you actually take all that data and turn it into insights? How do we actually run a bunch of models that we might be seeing in an organization or a campaign, and then suddenly decide, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Or how do we, and it's almost like, how do you play with the data? How do we come up with new novel ways to interact? Uh, I think some of the places where we're gonna see this uh, much uh, exploding and much more is gonna be around the two areas around national security, uh, around, uh, we just saw this around the Boston bombings and, and what the needs are around data, and we've known about this for quite a long time, uh, especially after 9-11. And the second is around health. We're starting to now have much more of these, these devices like the Fuel and the Up and these wearable devices. And those devices just aren't at this big cursory uh, or sort of just this fitness level. We're starting to get into monitoring glucose, monitoring uh, uh, blood pressure regularly, all, all of these things. and so. What can we do with that data to not just improve our local health, uh, meaning our, for ourself uh, and wellness, but how do we improve that, increase that ac across populations uh, where we're able to actually understand what data is coming in and start making better decisions about how we actually take care of ourselves to improve our global uh, wellness metrics? So maybe just take it one step more specific. So what's sort of the what's the, what's the current hotness with respect to you know data data funding or big data funding in the venture world? What's the sort of thing that is is it sort of instrumented self instrumentation stuff where the people are instrumenting themselves for health? What's what's getting people excited right now in terms of futures here? I think a lot of people are, are and you can address this pretty well too. Uh, <laughs> but to you? Uh, it is. I think there's a lot, a tremendous amount of uh, emphasis has gone into just building the stack, the technology layers, the, 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 the engines of the car. What we haven't gotten to is really how do we create the verticalized solutions or the very specific technologies that can help those like at Pepsi or the CMO or the, or the security officer to actually make decisions. We're starting to see the glimpses of it, but those technologies and the interfaces with them are still very, very nascent. Um, so Kevin, I want to kind of bring you in and this, this uh, DJ's point with respect to the Boston bombings is maybe a good sort of segue into one aspect of you know, some of the dark sides of, of bigger data. You know, everyone at first was really excited that you know, there were all these photos floating around and people felt like they could be sort of citizen cops and go out and play sort of, someone said like sort of Scooby-Doo when they'd be out there and you know, trying to find out who, exa who exactly was behind it and search through all of these reams of photos and video. And of course, what came out of that was that uh, you know, a bunch of people were rapidly identified who absolu had absolutely nothing to do with the bombing. And you know, while in the limit that might one day have been useful, we could have ruled out everybody one by one. Um, that's a joke. We never would have done that. Um, the, the 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 deeper issue was that you know this sort of points to one of the dark sides of this incredible amount of data: the possibility of constantly finding signal when there's really nothing but noise. Yeah. So 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 the 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 saving grace of uh, of what happened uh, relative to the the example of the Boston bombing is is that. Uh, all that bad data was not immediately translated into action. Um, and I think that this is the, this is sort of the, for me, this is the, the interesting and dark problem uh, of our time, which is that I, I think that as surely as, as you know, the, the point that you started with, which is that um, companies and institutions that work effectively with data will always perform better uh, than, than ones that don't is, is true. But it is, I think it is also true that, that companies, institutions, industries, for, um, that rely entirely on data uh, will always fail. Um, uh, that, that there has been a drive towards not augmenting 
uh, human perception uh, and, um, and ideas, but rather supplanting them. Um, and that you can see this most notably in the markets, uh, but you can see it on Amazon, you can see it on Netflix, uh, you can see it anywhere where uh, data is being translated back into action without somebody at some point in the middle taking a look at it and number one, trying to understand what is actually happening there and number two, deciding what to do as a result of that. Um, and uh, what is, you know, what's, what's great about what happened uh, a relative uh, to, to the example you gave is, is that Reddit is still distinct from law enforcement, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, in, in, in ways that, uh, in ways that like, you know, the AP tweet was not distinct from the market, right? Where those, where those two institutions, which in fact are separate, uh, have become fused at the data level uh, and thus uh, have profound economic effects, um, there are still a few places, law enforcement is one of them, where they are distinct. Why don't you draw, just for people, I mean, I'm sure most people in the room are aware of what happened with this AP phishing problem where suddenly, you know, some stories went out that caused this ripple in the market, but maybe draw that a little bit more. I mean, for people who hadn't sort of thought through, I mean, you draw a really, I think, important implication to yeah. what happened and in terms of sort of mechanically responding to a data signal yeah. without anyone between it and yeah. the... Um, I mean, one way, one way to understand what happened there, it, like, just to sort of, like, look at it historically is, is that, you know, it starts with, uh, it, it, in a way, that story, which you know was what nine percent of the market disappeared for a little while, uh, uh, that starts with the idea of a non-human reader, um, and and maybe the most important non-human reader that we have around us uh, are the panda algorithms uh, at Google, uh, and they affect how things are written, they affect what is written, they affect even the actual word choices. So at the Huffington Post. A headline, the headline for Michael Jackson's death was Michael Jackson death rather than Michael Jackson dies because that will perform better uh, in an algorithmic uh, determination of what, who's going to read what. And that's, it sort of starts there and then it moves to uh, things like Narrative Science, a company out of Chicago which will basically write stories based on data, uh, turn a bunch of data into something designed for humans uh, which then goes back into a non-human reader. So you have a bunch of data that gets translated into English and then that English gets parsed back into data uh, somewhere over here. Uh, and that cycle where it just surfaces for a second, uh, where it's just for human consumption, that's basically what happened uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the AP the other day, which is that uh, something that was intended for human eyes, which is Twitter, uh, is being processed with what are called sentiment uh, analysis algorithms, which basically are scanning Twitter to say uh, what is actually happening and how can we move on the market quicker than anybody else based on that information. And it's, it's treating English like data. It's like the data, it's like the, the telephone game that you used to play as a kid gone wrong. Yes, exactly. And at very yeah. high speed. Right, at right, at super high speed <laughs> and, and with no humans uh, in, in the middle, right? It's like, it's like a telephone talking to a telephone, uh, which is a super, non-entertaining game. Uh, um, so Unless you're watching the markets, then it's really... <laughs> yes, yes, uh, uh, yeah, whether it's good entertainment or not is uh, up for grabs. Um, uh, but, you know, the, 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 you know, the grim reality, right, is, is that uh, there is greater and greater leverage being placed upon uh, that kind of systematic and automatic interpretation of data that may or may not be real. Right, that like the you know in the case of the AP tweet, it was that their their account was hijacked uh, for I think maybe just for a couple minutes, and that's enough yeah. uh, to to really uh, unhinge the market. And by the way, that's not even done with enormous malice necessarily, right? Like, and you could imagine what could be done with malicious intent. Uh, and there, one can argue that that happens all the time uh, in the market every day, but that's a that's a broader point. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Frank, let me take it back to you for a second. You know, I, before I let you, you sort of sort of got a, a different perspective you want to bring as well. But maybe talk to this point that Kevin brings up. You know, no one would say that. I mean, Pepsi's in the in a business where suddenly you know you've got telephones talking to telephones. There are humans in the process all the way along. But talk a little bit about as data rises in importance, how do you how do you avoid these kinds of false positive problems and make sure that you know we're acting on real signal. It's not that we've just collected so much data that my God, we finally discovered we need to kill an entire product line. And oh wait, that was just an anomaly. Right, right. I mean, look, I, I guess I start 
I start by disagreeing with the, the premise uh, of, of, of the panel, right, which is in the 21st century, big data is king. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree totally that big data is going to set the new foundation. It's going to be critical. It's going to separate winners from losers. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's, it's a horse versus locomotive moment, I think, uh, in culture. But there, what we're trying to do and what any brand is trying to do is to create meaning for consumers and then motivate behavior. And how do you do that? You tell stories. You create experiences. You have to engage them. So, you know, by the time you data points you and gets you to the door, you then have to say something. You know, and then you have to ask the question: What I say, whatever I say, is that going to be meaningful to them? Will it motivate behavior? And that's a creative, that's a creative leap. And 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 so I think the the new king is really, or, or let's say the management of the kingdom is a marriage of of data and intuition and data and imagination. It's 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 that combination of things. Um, that's the first piece. The second thing is, is that I think is, is important is intent. You know, what, why does your company exist? Why does your brand exist? And, and that helps you ask the questions you know, of the data. So when, when you have the human element there, um, you know, Google, when they, when they um, found the correlation between uh, the, a flu and, and, and they actually were able to track that down effectively, they were looking for correlations in the flu virus, but they could have asked it about crime. They could ask it about the spread of joy. They could have asked it about sure. anything. Right. And so, so I think intent, and creativity become a, a critical element of it. And the thing that, that, that I'm trying to figure out, and, and this is, we're so early in the game, this is, um, I think it's the most interesting time, is how do you build a system where art and science work hand in hand? You know, how do you build a system where people who understand data, who aren't afraid of data, but also aren't afraid of intuition, kind of work, work together? And, uh, and that's what we're trying to build, and, and we put together on the Gatorade side, we put together something called Mission Control, and it's a small manifestation of that, you know, where we have in the same room you know, the data scientists who are analyzing the data with the kind of social media folks who are actually pushing out content uh, on, on the social media sites with real content creators who are developing reactive content. When they see something in the marketplace, they're actually building that content. Uh, and and it's, it's an interesting process, um, but we're learning as we go, and we're iterating, and, and, and we're adapting. But at the end of the day, there is always, I think, a creative leap that has to, has to be made. And, right. and Kevin and I were talking before, you know, you, in the gaming world, it's the same, same thing. You, know, you can get all the data you want, but then the question is, is the game fun? You know? and, 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 and that's a creative leap. So what, just to, what, what's come out of that that's actually surprised you? I mean, okay, fine, I get it. There's, an, there's a science, there's an art on top of it, but what's, give, me an, give us an example, grounded in something. Give us an example of something that's come out of this entire process that surprised you, caused you folks to change the way you do business, but sort of some measurable implication. Yeah, um, I'd say in, in the music space. So, so Pepsi, the brand, the brand Pepsi, um, which is one of Pepsi, it actually is PepsiCo's largest brand on, on a global basis, um, has this deep history in music. And so... So what we've traditionally done, we've, we've sponsored artists um, who kind of stumble off the stage with 10 Grammys and we go like, that's a star, let's you know, put them in a commercial and, and, have them, <laughs> and have them do something that's interesting and, and get the halo effect. Um, but all that's changed now, so people want brands that are much more active in the, the music ecosystem. So what we started to do is look at market failures within the current music ecosystem. And we started to ask the question, how can we actually provide value within that ecosystem? So what surprised me is, is that, um, one, the extent to which traditional music companies do not leverage big data to make those decisions. So we, we, saw that, we see that as an opportunity. And we see ourselves as complementary to the uh, traditional uh, record companies. What surprised me is that um, a lot of the people who have been trained, particularly as MBAs, are, are trained to manage risk, but aren't trained to manage creativity. And, and, uh, and so that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing because um, you know, once you, we've collected all the data and we're looking at making, creating value in the, in the music space, we're left with insights, but not actionable insights. Mm. And so, so bridging that, that gap and finding that kind of talent, um, to me, it has, been, has been the most difficult thing. Um, but, but we've had success um, in, in just trying. You know, we created an a, a independent label called Green Label Sound and, and what we've seen is by just taking this new approach and, and offering this new path, artists who never would associate with a brand you know, because they felt like it was selling out, suddenly um, all of them are coming to us because they feel like there's a new way for us to connect to fans, to understand our mar the marketplace, to, um, to create value in a way that benefits their fans and benefits them as, as artists. So, so it, it's that, 
in the music space, I think it's been the most successful for us. And, um, and the last surprise is this, um, and I won't name the company, but a large technology company that is probably one of the best known super crunchers has tried to go into music several times. And, and, and it's really to Kevin's point. And they've gone into, they, they made their foray into the music space purely on data, purely an engineer's perspective. And they fell miserably every single time. And, and, it, and it was at first surprising to me, but I think it's that lack of connecting to the human element and understanding how people are connected, understanding how to create meaning, understanding that imagination is as important as, as the data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that's prevented them from making that leap. Uh, Michael, I want to bring you back in on this. I mean, we're talking, you know, we're sort of talking about finance, we're talking about some startups, we're talking about politics, we're talking about consumer products. What industries aren't we talking about that, you know, from your research, where data really has a, a, a big role to play. There's a kind of an arbitrage and a, an opportunity. People talk about energy, for example, yeah. energy explorations. But what are some industries we are not talking about that we should be, that really where the opportunities maybe are even richer than the ones we've described? Yeah, I mean, I, I, first of all, I, uh, I think we should have an interesting discussion. I mean, I, I, I do think that, that it isn't, you know, data versus everything else. Uh -huh. And I don't think data is the cure for everything. I think on balance, we could use more data. I agree. <laughs> when it comes, right? And I also think, you know, creativity and intuition have very specific roles to play when interacting with data. So I think intuition is great for creating hypotheses. I think it can be extraordinarily dangerous to be the only basis on which to make a decision, right? And, it do, and data doesn't substitute for creativity, so I think we agree on a lot of things. Um, but in terms of what industries, I, so DJ mentioned one, right? Healthcare, there's so much opportunity there. Now there's so much data being generated. And you know, we usually find that when you combine data from multiple sources, you can do more inventive things and more creative things and create more value. But if you look at the data that comes from payers, right, from the insurance companies, if you look at the data that comes from uh, providers, that is, you know, doctors and hospital groups, et cetera. If you look at all the data that's coming from consumers and Fitbits and, you know, uh, f Nike fuel bands, et cetera. And if you look at all the data that comes from, you know, pharmaceutical, medical products companies during clinical trials, that data never or very rarely gets combined, right? So there's a tremendous opportunity to combine data from different places. And one of the things we're studying now is what happens when you open data or make it liquid or liberate it and what, when you can combine data from multiple sources. I think, so healthcare is huge. Uh, energy is another big one. Again, you know, it, we're throwing off data, you know, this exhaust data, kind of a joke in energy as well. You know, this is a term where, you know, if you drive a car and it's not a Chevy Volt or Tesla, you know, you get exhaust coming out the back, you know, out, out of the tailpipe. Now, if you drive an organization, as Paul mentioned, right now, you know, data comes out as exhaust, and and energy is a place where that happens, right? Whether it, you know it's advanced metering infrastructure and you know the sorts of things that come from smart meters, et cetera, uh, oil and gas, et cetera, a huge amount of data. So there's a lots of opportunity in data, and then broadly, there's this you know set of parts of the economy uh, for which there's a tremendous productivity imperative, particularly for parts of the world where. You know, everybody's aging, which includes most of the developed world, but China because of one child. And so things like, you know, how are you going to deal with healthcare one, but how are you going to improve the productivity of education? How are you going to improve the productivity of the public sector? Those are all places where the use of data is, you know, the opportunity is huge, and, and except for intelligence agencies, um, generally has not been used to its greatest extent. So I think in, on all of those sectors in the economy and many others, um, there's a lot of untapped opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I, I would also, I mean, I, I would also add, you know, just because we happen to be in LA, right? I mean, that the, that the effect of all of this in entertainment is uh, is just like we're just we're just beginning to see it, and you know that if we, you know, we, it is it is it is it is not, it is it's easy even right now to look back at a period in which we tried to determine what people liked because of Nielsen boxes and Nielsen journals as like uh, you know like incredibly naive. Uh, uh, in, a, in a profound way, uh, and that the idea that people's taste and consumption related to the things that they actually like and love uh, is becoming visible is transforming how, how entertainment gets made, who makes it, uh, and how it rolls out. Um, sometimes that's really good, uh, and sometimes it's entering into these same loops uh, where you know, human analysis is being removed from it. But, but overall, I think, it's a, I think it's a really positive shift. Entertainment is the classic hippos yeah. business, yeah. right? Yeah. That in Mad Men and marketing the old school way, right? It's like sit around like that one's going to work, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. no, but it's a, it's a really great point. I mean, the, the, you hear this all the time, this kind of anecdotal empiricism. It's like this big data stuff is great, 
that the guy down the hallway who brought us this project made us more money. So you know, it immediately invalidates everything else that's going on, right? I mean, it's yes. it's the, the the hot project phenomenon. Yeah. Right? I mean, you, know, you see that across every organization. One, somebody has a, a hot project that does well, and everyone says, well, you know, all this other stuff are great, but this is yeah. the thing that's making us money, and it wasn't driven by data. Or the hot hedge fund manager. Or the hot. <laughs> <laughs> But you see that, I mean, we see that a couple different, both, both ways, yeah. right? So it, it, one of the classic things is, one, we have people who drive up off, off cliffs, we have data that can drive us, uh, up off a cliff. You know, if you don't, look at how many people actually drive off cliffs using their GPS device, which is that small little screen, and the voice is telling you, it's like, turn right, turn right, and then somebody actually ignores all reality. And, and don't believe me, just type into Google GPS and cliff, and you'll see actually how many people actually do it. <laughs> and take videos doing it. Wow. <laughs> uh, but, but there's also that side which is talked about of like, how do you be human? Because the point of data is not to displace your, our human gut instinct. It's, we should start with intuition. We're human for a reason. And we use data to iterate. And we use that to augment ourselves. And I think one of the ways we do that, which we haven't really talked about, is who are these people? And one of the things that, that I like to say is, if you think of it as a bridge, who's your Spock on the bridge? Who's the person that's helping you understand that intuition of the data, talk about it, so that people may make a decision that is totally contrary to the decision, but you are doing it with intention because you understand the situation. This seems like a pitch for everyone to have data scientists in residence. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> so, so Jim, talk a little bit about the people side of things, because you know we're talking a lot about the data and about these you know, amorphous humans wandering around generating this data. But I think one of the things that bothers people about a very data-centric approach to politics is politics inherently is the art of the personal. And once you start introducing numbers, they may be right, but people are offended anyway. Well, look, uh, data has to, the way we use data was to make everything we did easier and more targeted. So the example I like to use is the final week of the campaign, uh, a friend of mine was knocking much against her will doors in Wisconsin. She came back and she said, you guys are going to win. And I said, how do you know? And she said, because I was knocking on the door on one side of the street, the Romney campaign was on the other, they hit every single door. I was told to hit two doors. I had six scripts on my iPhone. I was told which of the six scripts to use. As soon as I left the thing, uh, an email went out from me giving them their own personalized website, www.barackobama.com backslash that voter's name. Mm. And all of their stuff was loaded onto that website. Mm. And then later they were contacted by, this, by the volunteer uh, on Facebook and on email the next day to see if they were moving. We built this thing called targeted sharing that allowed, took a year and way too much money, but it allowed us to use Facebook to persuade people. We spent a billion dollars to figure out a simple truth. What your friends and family and neighbors say is more important to your consumer decisions and your political decisions than anything else because you're getting so much data thrown at you because you're getting hundreds of millions of dollars of negative ads. So the final six days of the campaign, six million people logged on to Facebook through BarackObama.com and they saw a 20 second Michelle Obama video because everyone loves Michelle Obama. And at the end of the 20 seconds, we had matched our data with their data and we gave them five of their best friends who were undecided voters and said, click here to send them a video, click here to send them information. Of those people, 78% of them voted for Barack Obama. We became the first presidential campaign since Richard Nixon to get a majority of the undecideds at the end. In part, the most important reason is that we had the better candidate with a vision for this country, that people wanted to go do those things. <laughs> Right, the human part. No, that really is true. There wouldn't have been four million people volunteering the final weekend if it wasn't Barack Obama. But we used that data to make, you know, the volunteer in, in Wisconsin's time more relevant and have her have a more enriched conversation with people. And we measured everything. We measured how far the door of our volunteer offices had to be from the front desk to get people to walk in. We measured all the forms of persuasion against each other. You know, when we had 20 million people on our email list. Once you got an email from me, and I'm sure a lot of you did, we believe very deeply in something called A-B testing. You test one thing against the other. By the time you got that email, we had tested 24 different versions of it before we went to the whole list. We tested how big the donate button was, who it was from, how big the font was, what the picture was, you know, all those things that maximize, we figured out we could maximize our returns 82% by A-B testing all of our emails. And one day we came up with this idea, our chief analytics officer came to me and said, people really like George Clooney. 
And I said, excellent. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and so we decided to do a dinner with Barack. And we did these all the time. You, you gave three bucks and entered a chance to win with Barack Obama. That did about $3 million every time we did it. Dinner with Barack and George Clooney did $12 million, <laughs> right? So I went to our data team and said, figure out why that happened. And the data guy goes, you don't need data for that. He's hot. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you should you know, have tested it just with Clooney. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's the amazing thing. You, you hear these, these kind of statements, and, and I, you know, I'm kind of hearing this kind of, this sort of a little surprise from the audience. They're like, wow, you guys did that. The amazing thing is what, what Jim's talking about is day in and day out for most of the modern companies. Yeah. This is like, this is every single moment of Facebook, LinkedIn, yeah. Twitter, Google. That's what we do. Yeah. And so what Michael and everyone else is telling you, if you're not doing this, you are behind the curve. Right. I'm sorry, that's just reality at this point. But, but you know, to Kevin's point, and you're 100% right, for some companies, there's an ecosystem that's set up that makes that difficult. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you have, and I don't, I don't wanna pick on Nielsen, but if you have Nielsen measuring uh, your media, if you have a, an advertising agency that's, that uses kind of traditional sampling, you're, you're, you're contending against all of that. Um, and, and, and you might change it internally, but we actually, we actually have to face that entire ecosystem and change that. That's the difficulty that we're facing. And, 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 and that's a battle I think a lot of CPG companies have, particularly those that, that really became, that have iconic brands that grew up in the 20th century through mass marketing, mass distribu distribution, lowest common denominator uh, assessments, and, and through demographic uh, connection to consumers. All that is why gone. you guys came up with the UPC code to get start to get those advantages. And, yeah, and, and you guys have an absolute much difficult, more difficult problem because of the, if you're grounded in reality, it's a tangible object. 100%, 100%, but, you know, but if you try to go out and buy, go out and buy a TV program and say, you know, I don't want to buy a TV program that's based on the demographics of 18 to 49 because I don't even know what that means. You know, I don't know, I don't know how those people are connected, 18 to 49 year olds right. across the United States. I have no idea what that means. Uh, I want to use big data that shows cultural groupings of people who have similar values and similar propensities to purchase certain products. I want to buy that way. They will, they would kick you out of their office. Like I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I'll call you later. It won't happen, you know. But I think it will eventually happen. But you know, see, that's exactly right. I guess I would disagree with your statement. Most companies aren't doing this. Most companies are still spending hundreds of millions of dollars using using Nielsen. And I will pick on them for a second. Mm -hmm. You know, we ended up saying that's a system that they use during Mad Men. Mm -hmm. I mean, 40 years ago. So we paired with a startup and bought set top box data off of people's cable systems and allowed us to then go match it with our data to beam directly to people that we wanted to talk to. We saved $41 million the final month of the campaign doing that way. And, and to your point, the companies aren't doing that because it has to have a culture change. Yeah. And to say that you're gonna throw away the old ways is a problem when these other companies are doing this you know, we've been doing it for a very long time. Yeah, let's start, the, re let's start the revolution, let DJ. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm talking about the specifically <laughs> the new companies, new companies. Are, are, are doing it. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I I'm absolutely emphasizing that the high speed, high growth companies are recognizing that's how you get the, how they get cadence in the organization to keep up or catch up. And, and just like you guys did to overtake, uh, overtake another type of organization and, and get a competitive advantage. Yes. But Hollywood's a good example. They're still rolling out movies the same way they rolled out movies. They're getting crushed. And they're getting crushed. Well, um, there, there, yeah, well, there is, uh, Ep Epigogix plays a role, right? Um, so um, so Epigogix is a, it's a, a company that's uh, out here in LA, uh, started by a couple of, uh, of uh, quants uh, from the UK who uh, thought that they could do for the entertainment industry what they've done for the market because that worked out great, uh, and so they uh, they have uh, they have uh, they have narrative uh, algorithms that c you feed in the script doesn't not not the cast you know not like not the production designer just the script and it'll spit out a number that tells you whether it's a five million dollar movie a fifty million dollar movie five hundred million dollar movie and that's used uh, in studios out here right so it's like and by the way that sounds like a terrible idea. Right? That sounds, it sounds like a profound misunderstanding of the opportunity in this, but it is, it is changing. It is, it is changing, right? I, I mean, like, like, I think things are done very much in an old way, but they, they are, they're finding, they're finding their way through this, partly because they just have to, and I, and I think, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I think one of the other interesting things that 
just let me quickly right. remind people in, and like, just maybe after Michael speaks, we'll, uh, we'll open it up to some questions, mostly from people from Nielsen's, but anyone else? <laughs> 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 Michael, sorry. No, think, yeah, and Mad Men producers. I think one of the other things which is exciting is, you know, DJ mentioned a bunch of these online companies where it's relatively easy to do A-B testing or with email, right? Because it's just electronic stuff. You yeah. flip or switch. But, you know, one of the other things is now we're instrumenting the physical world, right? So everything from running shoes to, you know, the, the east span of the Bay Bridge, you know, all of this video that's out there. And so now we can actually start to do A-B testing in the real world as well, right? So, you know, McDonald's, for instance, has a warehouse where they have, you know, several McDonald's stores inside it. And they can start testing, you know, what happens when we change what we're, what we're uh, uh, making behind the counter? How does that change throughput, et cetera? And so this idea of conducting experiments actually in the real world doesn't only apply to online companies, but now increasing the offline companies, CBJ companies, retail companies, et cetera. So it really is you know, a potential for everyone to adopt these types of methods, but it's going to be hard. There's, there's lots of things you have to do to get it done. Yeah. Um, we have a mic in the middle of the room. If anyone would like to jump in and ask questions, just uh, jump up and fire away. Yes. Yeah, hi, I'm Michael D. I want to address my uh, comments and questions to Jim. Um, uh, Al Gore's in the building, by the way. I wish you guys had gotten together 13 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a big, different world. Um, I'm fascinated about the difference between campaigning and selling a candidate and selling positions and governing mm -hmm. and leading. And I was a donor to the campaign, so I got bombed with all your emails. And I still get bombed uh, with, with all the emails. But, but what I don't see. I don't see the translation of the techniques that you have uh, developed and articulated to create these election victories. I haven't seen that translate into an ability to lead the populace, to create leadership, create government. We've got a government that's run by 400, 535 people in, in Senate and the House, and they're driven by their populace, but yet here we are on, you know, you can enumerate any number of issues, and there's this fundamental abil inability right now to harness this uh, persuasive power to govern our country better. Long-winded, you get the point. Mm -hmm. How do you translate this power into an ability to lead the country to the right direction? It is a great question. It is the fundamental question of our time. You know, I ran the healthcare war room in the White House when we passed healthcare, which was, I promised the president it would take six months and took 14. Uh, but after eight years, we got it done. And it, it, one of the problems is the diffusion of media, right? The famous bully pulpit of the presidency is much harder now. We all were going up. People got their political news from three different sources, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Now 16 different people control a share of the nightly political discussion. If you are young, you're watching Jon Stewart. If you are, you know, my fiance, you watch Rachel Maddow and only Rachel Maddow. If you, <laughs> you know, if you're my dad, you watch Leno. And it's harder to have a long-term discussion about that. The week before the 2010 midterm elections, you know what the number one most watched political news network in the country was? Univision. Because Univision had the biggest bulk, the biggest share of Latino population, and the rest of it was aggregated. That is a much harder thing. So, so after the election, the president asked me to think about this. And I went and drank a bunch of Italian wine in Italy for a month and tried to reimagine how you'd engage uh, in government. And we formed this new thing called Organizing for Action, which takes our volunteers, our tech, and tries to scale engagement with government to a much bigger scale to change the way politics are done on the ground, to get people involved and fight for some of these things that we believe in very deeply, like immigration reform, climate change, and other things, to change the engagement. Because while we passed health care, we didn't you know, use uh, everyone to help us. We forgot the simple thing. It wasn't yes, we, it wasn't yes, he can. It was yes, we can. And unless we have a broader discussion about how we're all going to take control of this government, these big problems are going to continue to be harder and harder to solve. So we're out there trying to figure out how you do this. It is a startup in every sense of the word, but I think it's one of the fundamental, most important decision uh, things we're going to figure out of our time. Next question. Thank you. Hi. <coughs> I have a question for the whole panel. Basically, I've been following a lot of big data and how it's progressed over the time. And my question is how it affects uh, the young entrepreneur, the startup. So for example, for Pepsi Corp, you have tons and tons of customers that you come and pull data from, hit loads and loads of history. That gives you a huge competitive advantage. 
and let's say I'm a young entrepreneur who has an, the hypothesis to come up with a new drink that wants to go up against Pepsi and doesn't have the resources to collect the data or doesn't have any type of proprietary data to market their product, how do they compete and what's the best way to do that? Okay. And maybe, you know, just to, <laughs> and maybe just to sort of make it a, a more rounded question for everybody, I mean, in a sense, does, does ownership of big data create an unfair advantage in the sense that, you know, it makes, maybe does it, does it make industries more rigid, more difficult for new entrants to come in? Uh, why don't you start, Frank, maybe you can answer and invest later. Yeah, I mean, I, if I had the answer, I'd probably uh, go to Italy and drink some wine and, <laughs> and start, 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 start a company on that. But no, I, 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 look, clearly, clearly um, startups uh, will be at a disadvantage to larger corporations that are effective at collecting and analyzing big data. Um, however, much like running a campaign, um, the startup can be much more nimble and, and, and can adapt and is not burdened by the broader ecosystem. So um, if you take Pepsi, for example, um, we, we don't have a closed loop system. If you think about what we do, we connect to the consumer uh, with our brands through our media, we connect on our packaging, um, we, we connect with them outside the store, but once they're in the store, we don't really have the mechanism to actually collect that data directly. The retailer collects that data. Uh, and the, the liberator for us has been mobile. And so as consumers are using mobile more and more, whether it's through augmented reality or local recognition technology uh, or apps that allow them to kind of shop more effectively, we're starting to collect that data. But you know, that's an entrepreneurial opportunity. And, and, and it's not a standalone effort um, uh, by an entrepreneur, but it's a way to plug into our ecosystem in a way that adds value to us. And we're constantly looking for that. You know, who can actually help us close the loopholes that exist uh, along that whole chain of, a, of, of speaking to a consumer that turns into a shopper that comes back out as, as a consumer. And so, um, yes, you're at a disadvantage, but I think even within our, our system, there are huge opportunities for entrepreneurs uh, who, are, who are creative in, in using data and helping us close those loops. Paul wanted me to say uh, you know, outrageous things. I think it's never been easier for a startup to compete against a big company because the ability to scale your ability to, to deal with big data, I think is far easier than the problem Frank has about trying to move a whole ecosystem in a big organization. Well, I think that was probably Jim's point as well, right? I mean, in reference to that last question, is even though you introduced data and fundamentally changed the way someone got elected, it didn't change anything in terms of this big organization called Congress. Right. In, in terms of how it operated, right? I mean, so there's a great example of how, you know, the nimble startup still got, you know, beaten in by the larger organization. So next question, thank you. Hi, uh, actually this is kind of a playoff of the last question, but it's directed specifically at Jim. Um, you guys weren't a startup in 2008 after you won and you had four years to plan. Now, uh, either the field is open to some new startup or you're about to give the largest political donation in the form of data to some unnamed candidate. <laughs> what happens, uh, aside from organi organizing for America, to everything that you've created and the systems that you've built? Did you have any other questions? <laughs> um, no. I think that's only, that's only one, right? Right, right. <laughs> uh, no, it, it is something that, that uh, we are struggling with and having discussions about uh, as we go. We have all these things, you know. Um, this is the part where you want to be a startup, right? Because we figured out a political campaign legally can't sell a product because then you're making a contribution above the, the limits and what you do with the data uh, is the big thing. Every time I'm able to go to Congress, members of the House and Senate are understandably very excited to have this discussion uh, and to have me give a better answer than I'm about to give you. Um, but I think the important thing is the data needs to be cross-platform and uh, and be used for a variety of things, both in groups that support uh, issues we care about. You know, there's all this nonprofit advocacy going out there and they ought to have this data too. And so we're trying to figure out the proper vehicle to use that. Um, I hope that it can be used by campaigns uh, and a whole bunch of other organizations to do things. But for people running in president in 2016, they have an easier job than that. I think they do exactly what you talked about. They go reinvent this. They do, and the very first day when the president offered me this job, I said to him, I only need one promise, and I'll say yes. I want you to promise me you're not going to run the same campaign you did last time. And he s looked at me strangely and said, Jim, you know, we won that one. <laughs> and I said, yes, Mr. President, I was there, the best party of my life. It was great. Um, <laughs> but if you run the same campaign, you'll get beat um, because everything has changed on how you do 
you know, interaction with folks. And the 2016 class has to figure this out. We have given them a head start on my side of the aisle, the way Bush gave the 2008 campaign a head start. Um, but obviously, they didn't win that campaign. So people need to reinvent how you do this. And you know, these guys will, will be you know, helping us figure that out, uh, both parties. Um, but I think what we want to do is just be pretty agnostic about how it's used and get the data out there and let people use it how they may. Thank you. Another question? Hi. What's the big data story from an emerging markets context outside of the United States, outside of the EU? Are we talking about the ability to leapfrog mistakes that have been made and, and jump ahead, or are we looking at a situation where because the, the plumbing and the infrastructure doesn't work in terms of uh, good access to power or telecom or, or you know, uh, data collection, that there will be no big data story in emerging markets, at least not for a long time. Michael Jordan. Uh, there is a big data story in emerging markets. I would say it's much spikier there. So I, I'd say you know the, 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 the tide has lifted more boats here. Um, but if you look at the best users of big data in emerging markets, they're as good as the global standard. But then uh, oftentimes you know, the rest of the country is struggling to catch up. So that, that's roughly what I'd say. It's, uh, there is a big data story in emerging markets. It tends to be more concentrated in the leaders. Uh, but that's going to change over time for sure. Yeah, and the early stage guys, we're seeing great stuff happen, predominantly because of the mobile platform and the interaction you can have with a specific user and the types of data, the geo, the localized, the social, coming to one platform. We see phenomenal advances in the way people are leveraging it. Uh, yeah, I'd, lo I'd, look, I'd look specifically at something like Ushahidi uh, in, in Africa, which is, uh, which is a means of gathering uh, information through uh, mobile devices for everything from uh, electoral reform and electoral policy to disaster relief, uh, and it's a it's a form of on the ground sensing and data management that has never we've it's not only not only has it never existed there it's never existed anywhere, um, and it's really it's it's quite profound actually. Great, thanks. We have uh, another question. Yeah, go ahead, Mitch Julis. I'm old enough to remember reading uh, the Affluent Society, which is about how uh, society constructs itself, designs itself, so it, uh, it doesn't meet the needs of society, it, meets, it creates wants, and that feeds into marketing. And then that came out, I guess, in the 60s, early 60s, and then we had the making of the president, how Nixon was sold to the American public. You have books like Nudge by Cass Sunstein, who was in the Obama administration, which talks about uh, designing choices so that people have uh, the sense that they're making choice, ha making a good choice, but it's being guided in a certain way. It's called liberal paternalism, and that's his phrase. So I'm wondering, in the context of a democracy, when you use big data, sort of similar to the way you use it in selling products, how much of, of it bothers you or not that what you're doing is selling a product and creating wants as opposed to meeting needs. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe one this this one on the political front again. This 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 deep seated sort of problem people have in some sense with data and its uses in politics. You know, we formed a privacy and uh, group that met every day in the campaign to wrestle through these uh, deals. And, and I guess uh, I would take some some uh, disagreement with the question. Uh, I do think that. You know what we believe data can be used for is to uh, is to find things that are useful as compared to interesting, right? It can allow us to have a more enriched conversation with people about issues they want to talk about. It can bring people in. You know, we had 80 percent more volunteers in 2012 than we did in 2008, which is unbelievable considering everyone for two years said, "Oh, he's not as sexy again. He can't do all the stuff. People aren't as excited." We had 80% more people involved in this campaign, in part because of data, because we found new people who'd never been involved in politics who wanted to seize control of their future uh, and become a piece of this. And so we really used data to empower more people. Uh, and uh, But there were huge privacy concerns. In the middle of the presidential campaign, SOPA exploded, right? And there was huge uh, debates about both sides of that. It's an issue that you know paired two traditional Democratic supporting 
groups against each other and really kind of made us think about how you use data and how you use privacy in the middle of all of this ability to affect things. And you know, we really struggle with that. And it's something I think we're all gonna struggle with in the political sphere, probably more than you will in the commercial sphere. Well, I think, and Kevin, I, I know you see in that the academic world, one of the things that we see amongst young op entrepreneurs and one of the coolest things is they're very focused on taking that data and returning it back to the user yeah. as making a value add product. They're not trying to use the data to do something that undercuts the user. They're actually trying to make something useful like, hey, how do I take all these connections in your address book and actually give you something useful now? Or how do I take all this data from all these cars and tell you where you should drive? That's, that's a great use of data to turn it back to something to me that I can use that's not just in an Excel spreadsheet, but something I can interact with in a useful way. Great. Um, on, that, on that uplifting note, we're actually at the end of our time. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to stop here. I wanna honor your, your time, but thank you. Join me in thanking our panel for a great conversation. <laughs>